Hi, this is Joseph Komorowski, professor. Um, today, we will be covering Hurley's Introduction Logic, Chapter 1, Basic Concepts, uh, so more specifically, Section 1.3, Deduction and Induction. So, last couple of sections, 1.1, just as review, let's go over our argument structure, arguments made of, you know, premises, um, which support a conclusion. Premises are facts, reasons to believe, evidence. Um, it's supposed to have an inferential chain of reasoning to where one premise flows to another premise to another. And if you only have one premise, it's fine, but they're all supposed to flow right into the conclusion pretty easily. Um, section 1.2 went over non arguments versus arguments. Non arguments, you saw a bunch of examples of those. <coughs> And today's section 1.3 will be like different forms of arguments. So once we're into an argument, then we'll, what kind is it? And this is a more broad deduction and induction. And there'll be different types of um, deduction, induction. Think of it like, if I were to draw an analogy, think of these as type of Legos, deduction or space Legos. Induction are like Western Legos, like cowboys and Indians. Inside of deductive, which are space Legos, you might have Star Wars Legos, you might have Star Trek Legos, you might have different, you know, different types of space Legos. Those would be different forms of a deductive argument or different types of space Legos. <clears throat> and in inductive, in the cowboys and Indians, you might have ones that have I don't know, think of different, you know, Westerns that you've seen. What I'm getting at is there's many forms um, of arguments. Broadly speaking, there will be deductive and inductive, but then with, within each one of these, you'll have different forms. To see this real clearly, um, <clears throat> I've given you a handout. Um, differences between an inductive and deductive reasoning. So let me let me show you this in right here. So this handout, and you'll be able to get this online. Um, differences between inductive and deductive reasoning. So this is like a cheat sheet for in all of chapter one. Okay, number one, it's cheat sheet all of chapter one. So let's go down. Um, we divide these into two: inductive, deductive. The nature of them. Well, if premises are true and the argument is strong, conclusion probably is cogent. That word probably versus deductive. If the premises are true and the argument is valid, the conclusion is sound. Notice the language between these two. Keep in mind we're trying to recognize the form, right? When we come to an argument, it's like, well, what kind is it? Is it inductive or deductive? So if it's true, uh, premises, um, strong, cogent. So that's inductive language. True, valid, sound, deductive language. The characteristic indicator words. Now this is important. <clears throat> Inside of an argument, you might have trigger words like probably, improbable, plausible, implausible, likely, unlikely, reasonable to conclude. Think of it like this. The argument is not 100% certain, but it has degrees, meaning it can come close to the truth or farther away from the truth, but it's never 100%. And these words kind of signal that to you. Whereas deductive, you are 100% going to be wrong or right, necessarily, certainly, absolutely, definitively. These are very strong words or, or very strong language. You might say a deductive argument is stronger than an inductive argument. For some of you that take other philosophy classes, or if you're science majors, I can break these two words down even further. Think of deductive as pure philosophy, pure logic or mathematics, very strong conclusions, certain conclusions, 100% all or nothing conclusion. Think of inductive as the scientific method. We use a scientific method all day long, all over the world for centuries, right? In science, you will never have a 100% certain theoretical argument, you will have, hey, this is the best theory we have today. 
it explains a lot about reality. It's not 100% certain. Why? Because if a better scientific theory comes along, we'll replace it with our older theory. We'll, you know, we'll revise. So think of the inductive as the scientific method and deductive as pure logic, pure mathematics. So that's it helps some of you. Nature of inferential links, um, the reasoning process going with inductive. The premises provide only probabilistic support for the conclusion. If the premises are true, the conclusion's probably true. Deductive. Premises provide necessary support for conclusion. If the premises are true, then the conclusion cannot be false. In fact, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. If you have a deductive argument and the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. You can think of um, the difference like that. The character or form, you might even put another one in there, the structure. You can use any one of these words. It gets the same um, concept, character, form, structure, how it's made. Okay, so how is an inductive argument made? So this is where you get, remember how I was talking about space Legos with deductive and inductive, and I was saying like space Legos for deductive were like Star Wars, Star Trek, you know, something like that. So think of math based upon mathematics as Star Wars, based upon definitions, Star Trek, categorical syllogism, you could think of another type of space Lego. Now we're talking about the exact form within deductive, or the exact form within inductive. And it turns out there's a lot of them. So an inductive prediction based upon the known past or present event, which is separate from analogy, that's another form. Similarity between items, affairs, and events versus generalizations based upon statistics versus authority, witness, based upon the significance of signs and symbols, causal inference, cause and effect. That would be like, hey, um, I'm going to go to my room and I'm going to flip the light switch on. When I do this, the effect will be that the lights come on. I'm causing it to come on or, or you might say specifically electricity is causing the lights to come on and the switch is making electrons flow down the conductor. I use this real specific language because I'm an x-ray tech <laughs> and in our, um, in our degree, we really learned a lot more about electricity. But anyways, cause and effect. We use this all the time. It seems to be like a fundamental feature of reality. We're causing things all over the place all day long. Or, you know, lightning causes the sound of thunder. You just think of all kinds of examples. But these are forms. So when you see an analogy, when you see two things being compared to each other, you know that it's not a deductive argument. It's inductive. It will never be deductive. When you see an argument based upon definition, in other words, something's defined, and then you conclude something about somebody based upon the definition, um, you know that that is not inductive, it's deductive. So in section 1.3, you're going to be pulling out the differences between them and how to recognize them in your homework. Uses. So inductive uses are we discover scientific laws by using these. And then in deductive, how is this used? We apply scientific laws that we get from inductive. We apply those with certain reservations, or uh, we have geometric proofs. So we get geometric proofs. This goes hand in hand with mathematical laws, but don't get too hung up on this use as one. And then also traditional definition on inductive, the argument proceeds from the particular or the general. On deductive, the argument proceeds from the general to the particular. Um, do not get hung up on this at all. There might be a question on your homework, but I do not emphasize this in my critical thinking or logic courses. Because even though usually deduct or inductive arguments proceed from the particular or the general, there's an exception. Hurley gives you an example. And in deductive, even though the argument proceeds from the general to the particular, it really gives you an example. So you might say traditionally, or this is the old school distinction between inductive and deductive. You might have to know this for a question. Fine. You know, as far as your homework, 
But I would say everything that I discussed up here, these are the big distinctions between and deducted. The forms that they have, you know, do they provide probable or certain conclusions? What are their trigger words? This is what I want you to know. Also, um, if, they, if, if it's a strong or cogent versus valid or sound uh, kind of terminology coming at you. So anyways, why do I spend a lot of time on that cheat sheet? Well, because it's going to make your life easier when you get to 1.3, which we're at now. <clears throat> so let's go through 1.3. You can read about Ruth Marcus. She scares me. She got into something or she developed things in modal logic. Modal logics, if you go into advanced logic um, or even graduate level logic, and it deals with the necessity and contingency and possibility. And <laughs> anyways, this is really hard stuff, but it's fascinating. You want to get blown away, read about Ruth. She scares me because she's super smart. All right, here we are. 1.3. So that cheat sheet is, if, if, if you print that out and have that side by side on, on your homework, or as you read chapter one, your life will be easy. So now we're going to kind of review what I just went over. So the deductive argument is incorporating the claim that it is impossible for the conclusion to be false, given that the premises are true. On the other hand, an inductive argument is an argument incorporating the claim that it's improbable that the conclusion be false, given that the premises are true. Notice impossible, improbable. Probability comes in degrees, more probable, less probable. Impossibility is all or nothing. Think of it like zero or hundred. It's either false or it is true, or it is. It's either this argument is sound, 100% awesome, or 100% doesn't work. So the language is extreme here. Zero or 100, on or off, think of a light switch, or improbable. It comes in degrees. Um, so let's look at these two arguments, and you tell me which one you think is inductive. I'll read. The meerkat is closely related to the suricat. The suricat thrives on beetle larvae. These are premises, right? They're either true or false. Therefore, probably the meerkat thrives on beetle larvae. Is there a trigger word in here that stands out that gives it away? Think about it for a second. Look at the premises. Look at the conclusion. Is there a trigger word? Meaning right here, remember this section that we just went over? Is there a trigger word that stands out? Is it one of these? Which is, you know, in degrees, or is it all or nothing? For those of you that got it, correct. Probably. Probably is a trigger word that it's not 100% certain. It's in a degree. It's probably, less probable, you know, stuff like that. So we know this is inductive. We don't need to know exactly how probable. We just know, hey, there's a trigger word. Joseph talked about on the sheet. And right there, we know it's inductive. Now, do we know what form yet? No, but we don't need to. Why? Because we know that we have a trigger word that leads um, to degrees of um, how good the argument is. So later on, we'll see that this is in, in section 1.4. We'll see how strong a code you come about. But right now, we don't need to know that. Right now, we're just trying to find out what is it, induct. Let's read this one. Uh, the mirror cat is a member of the mongoose family. Premise form. All members of the mongoose family are carnivores. Conclusion. Therefore, it necessarily follows that the mirror cat is a carnivore. Notice the difference between that, necessarily, and probably. Yep, necessarily, right here, necessarily. So we know it's deductive, okay? So again, the purpose of this <clears throat> um, chapter is you're trying to figure out, okay, we already know we're dealing with an argument. Now we're trying to find out is it deductive, deductive or inductive. So when we scroll down, and again, I assume that you've already done this reading or that you will do this reading by the time you get to my video. So I'm, I'm not going over every single thing, just the things that stand out that are important. Um, when you do your reading, you'll find out that Hurley unpacks this even better than I do, and he gives you more examples, okay? But I try to make it easy with the cheat sheet. So let's go down to deductive argument forms. Okay, one based upon mathematics. You can read about this one. 
Again, what your cheat sheets say. Ding dong, based upon mathematics. So we already know that that's deductive because of the cheat sheet. But then when you come to Hurley, he's going to tell you why. An argument in which the conclusion depends on some purely arithmetic or geometric computation or measurement. Boom, there we go. Now we know why. So you go down here, just in case you're taking notes, you can highlight, you know, well, why is it based on FX? Well, there's some sort of geometric computation or measurement. And when you have that, <clears throat> You're going to get an all or nothing answer, right? Because math, 2 plus 2 equals 4. Is it kind of 4 or is it literally 4? Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. Or 2 plus 2 equals, I don't know, I feel that it could be 4. No. Deductive, right? So when you deal with mathematics, you're going to get a certain all or nothing conclusion. It's not going to be a probable conclusion. Mathematics is certain, all or nothing. 2 plus 2 equals 4. That is the answer. There's no degree. It's not kind of four, sometimes four. That would be over here. And that's just not where mathematics is. It's not inductive. Okay. So there's different things going on in these arguments. Argument from definition. So this one. Let's see here. Oops. I'm trying to highlight it in front of me. Uh, anyways, not working. Oh, that's why. Ah, forget it. Okay, so let's do this. Argument in which a conclusion is claimed to depend merely on the definition of some word or phrase used in the premise or conclusion. For example, someone might argue that because Claudia is mendacious, it follows that she tells lies, or that because a certain paragraph is prolific, it follows that it is excessively wordy. These arguments are deducted because their conclusions follow from necessity from the definitions of mendacious or prolific. Let's go back to mendacious. Call it is mendacious. It follows that she tells lies. This is an argument based upon definition because it's literally definition. Mendacious means that someone tells lies. So if it means that, and we say Claudius is mendacious, it means that she tells lies. So it's purely based upon definition, something follows. <clears throat> Um, so let's just do a mock example. Has anybody seen uh, Stranger Things on Netflix? Oh my gosh, mind blowing, right? If you haven't seen it, I, I'm going to be in prayer for you right now, man. My heart mourns for you. It's such an awesome series. Plus, I was raised in the 80s. All that kind of stuff you see with the music and how people dress, that was me. Um, but who's the main actor? Who is, who is the main, um, Oh man, I hate to sidetrack us, but we got to go there. Hold on. It is boom. Winona Ryder. Okay, so we're Noda Winona Ryder. I used to watch a lot of her movies when I was younger. She's in the 80s, she's about the same age as me. It turns out that at one time she was a kleptomaniac. Watch this. Anyway, she's awesome in there uh, in the series. Okay. And this isn't a bag on her motor. She's like totally awesome. But like everybody deserves a second chance. So at one point in time, she was caught stealing. And then she got convicted. I think she either did service or community service or jail, something like that, right? And then once she's done with all that, she just got into Stranger Things. Awesome actor. So what if I was to construct an argument? Renardo Ryder is a kleptomaniac. And because why? Because a kleptomaniac is someone who steals. So if I define what a kleptomaniac is and then I label that as a, you know, onto a person, it's an argument based upon definition. The conclusion falls. So, for example, Kleptomaniac is someone who steals. Therefore, an owner rider was a kleptomaniac. The first one, the premise. I'm defining it. And then the second one, I'm attaching that uh, somebody's name to the premise. So this is just an example of, you know, 
defining something and then uh, attaching it. We can define something in a positive way. Notice that I, I, I picked on her and I called her kleptomaniac. Um, really what I was trying to do is to get people to watch Netflix. No, just kidding. I really want you to watch Stranger Things. All right, so we're, we're moving out of this now. <clears throat> we're back to the homework. Where is Joseph taking us? Okay, so anyways, we got argument from definition. Now we're on to syllogisms. A syllogism is a fancy way of making an argument. A syllogism is always a two-step premise. One, two, conclusion. Aristotle thought of, um, he, he invented syllogisms, you might say. He's the father of logic. And let's just pause for a moment. Aristotle's the man. I'm just saying. Okay, he invented logic. <clears throat> Two-step um, premise and then a conclusion. So there's there's a few different types of syllogisms. Again, go to your cheat sheet, right? Categorical syllogism, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive, okay? Um, oh, and I want to give you a friendly reminder. So for some of you, that have already been here, good for you. For some of you, you might have forgot. In chapter one, in your, sorry, I'll move this over. In your book online, um, you have chapter one videos. You have flashcards. But if you click on the videos, you have a bunch of videos. I would say that um, deductive arguments right here. I would say that you watch all of them, you know, outside of watching mine. Unpack, me unpacking this, but these are also really good videos. We didn't really have those for chapter two, but we have those for chapter one. You also have those for chapter three. You also have, I think, a couple for the other ones, but that's just a, a reminder that you have videos. <clears throat> so let's go. Okay. Categorical, categorical syllogisms. If you have the words all, no, or some, you know you're dealing with a categorical syllogism, okay? Whether the argument works or not is, is secondary. We're just trying to recognize the form. What is it? Is this inductive? Is it inductive? Is it space Legos or Western Legos, right? Space Legos were deductive. Western was inductive. That was our little fun analogy. These are space Legos. They're deductive. Why? Because it's all some whatever. Those words are in there. Um, if some of you want to write this down, I'm going to really get into this in um, 1.4. You can take out all those words in there except for all, some, therefore, some, and then leave the R words. And you could strip this down into its super basic form. All X's are Y, premise one. Premise two, some X's are Z, conclusion, therefore, some Y or Z. That is a stripped down form of a categorical syllogism. So it turns out whatever your X's are, they have to be the same. You can plug in your X's, Y's, and Z's. And if your language or your definitions or terms uh, make sense, that argument has a form that if the premises are true, the conclusion follows 100% certainly. Why? Because the form um, is bulletproof, and we'll, we'll find out why later on. But for now, just take it for argument's sake. You're looking at a um, bulletproof syllogism. If the uh, if the premises are true, the conclusion will most certainly follow. And you can say, well, what if you were to switch out the language instead of talking about ancient forests, you know, this and that? Um, you can talk about something else, like sodas or something. So, anyways. Um, there you go with your categorical syllogism. Um, next, we have hypothetical syllogism, and you'll notice right here. Um, here, you'll notice that you have if-then statements. Okay, so with your if-then statements, if they line up a certain way, you will have a deductive argument in the form of a hypothetical syllogism. So <clears throat> if estate tax are abolished, then wealth will accumulate disproportionately. Premise two, if blah, 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 then conclusion. Therefore, if then, if you were to strip this down to its basic form, if X, then Y, if Y, then C. Therefore, if X, then Y. So you're like, what are we talking about? X, Y's, and Z's. We'll look at it. Write this down, if X, then Y. 
y then z, therefore f x then y. Write that down and then look at the language and notice that it repeats itself. For example, you'll have an x in the first one if the state tax are abolished, then look in your conclusion. You'll notice that the state taxes are abolished shows up again. So you can play around with that, look at it, and you realize that all hypothetical syllogisms have if then, if then, conclusion, if then. And you can look at that form. So when you recognize forms like if thens, you'll notice that you're in hypothetical syllogism. Now there's different kinds of these. Notice this one. If Fox News is a propaganda machine, then it misleads viewers. So we have if then, but then here we don't have an if then. We have Fox News is a propaganda machine. Therefore, Fox News misleads viewers. Look at this form. If X then Y, X, which is the second premise, therefore Y. This is called a modus ponens. You have an if then statement show up in the first premise, and then you're trying to prove, remember in this, uh, I believe it was section 1.1, your antecedent and conclusion, just for review. What's the antecedent? Is it the thing that follows the if or then? Correct. An antecedent follows the if. So this is proving the antecedent. So we're saying if the antecedent um, is true, then the consequent follows. Premise two, well, the antecedent's true. Conclusion, therefore, con um, the consequent follows. So if x then y, we're proving x, therefore y, modus ponens. Okay, so <clears throat> disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism has either or. Again, look at your cheat sheet down here. Disjunctive, either or, hypothetical, if then, categorical, all, none, some. Okay, we're trying to recognize deductive versus inductive, and these are just some of the forms that we have, right? Let's go back. <clears throat> either global warming will be arrested or hurricanes will be more intense. So you have two choices. Think of it either one or two. You don't have one, therefore you have two. So strip it down to its most basic form. Premise one, X or Y. You have two choices. Think of it real simply like that. You negate one of the choices, meaning you cancel it out. Therefore, you have the other choice. I mean, it's just, this is like stupid simple, right? And if it's not for you, no problem. Just keep on looking at that. Write down that form, X or Y, meaning I have two options, and then I delete one of them, not X, and then I have the other one, therefore Y. You could do this with A or B. Premise one, A or B. Premise two, not A. What would the conclusion be? Yeah, therefore B. You can do this with any letters you want. It's the same um, kind of structure. What matters is after you have that form, does the language work? But for right now, we don't need to worry about that. We don't need to know anything about global warming or arresting or hurricanes. We don't need to know about that. What we need to know is when we look at that, is there something that stands out that triggers this being deductive or inductive? Yes, either or. That right there gives it away, okay? So, brief review of deductive. You'll have to know that for your homework. Now we're moving on to inductive, okay? So in this one, I'll let you read more about these. I won't spend as much time on these, but prediction, an argument that proceeds from our knowledge of the past to a claim about the future. And then um, you can read Hurley's example right here. Argument from analogy. This is used all the time, analogous reasoning. If you don't understand one thing, let me make it more simple by having you understand this other thing. And this other thing is kind of like understanding this one thing. For example, if you don't know, like, like uh, lawyers do this all the time with juries, you might say, hey, I'm discussing my, uh, my client's innocence here. And if you don't understand this very complicated business transaction we're talking about, think of it like a car salesman. A car salesman walks onto a lot, he's trying to or sorry, somebody walks onto a lot and they come into contact with the car salesman. And the car salesman, so what the, what the lawyer is trying to do is he's trying to say, if you don't understand something very elaborate or let's say complicated about some business transaction, fine. He's going to make it more simple and he's going to talk about a car salesman. Do you understand about buying cars, like something more simple? If you understand that, then you can understand this more complicated thing. This is how analogies work. And... 
Here's, here's why. An analogy is an argument that depends on the existence of an analogy similarity between two things or states of affairs. So bottom line, you're comparing two things. When you notice an argument where you're comparing two things that are very similar, you're dealing with an analogy. And when you're dealing with an analogy, are you dealing with a deductive or inductive argument? Yes, bingo, analogy, inductive argument. And what that means is you're never going to have a 100% certain conclusion, but you're going to have a really close one. Hey, these two things are very similar. Therefore, my argument works. <clears throat> and you can read an example. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just read you this one. For example, someone might argue that because Christina's Porsche is a great handling car, it follows that the existence of a similarity or analogy between two cars. <clears throat> Uh, the certitude uh, tending such an inference is probabilistic at best, meaning this is complicated language, means it's never going to be 100% true, but it'll come close to the truth. It's probabilistic. A generalization, a generalization is an argument that proceeds from the knowledge of a selected sample to some claim about the whole group. Real quickly, think about it like this. <clears throat> take a sample, like say, hey, we have this magic drug, and if you take this pill, it's going to make you smarter. In fact, you'll know critical thinking and logic even more. Now, we've sampled 20 students out of, um, out of a class of 30, okay? And since we've sampled them, we've given this pill to them, and they're all smarter in critical thinking and logic. Therefore, the entire campus will be smarter if they take this pill. What's going on here? It's taking a sample size of 20 students out of a class, and then it's saying, hey, it worked for them, so let's apply it to the general population. It should work for them, too. Now, it turns out there's a serious problem with that. We need a lot more data. We need a lot more students. So now think of it this way. <clears throat> We've tested hundreds of thousands of college students at various campuses. We've given them this pill. It makes them smarter when they test uh, for critical thinking and logic. Keep in mind, we've tested hundreds of thousands of students throughout college campuses in the world. Therefore, uh, we can make a pretty good uh, probabilistic conclusion that we think if you take this pill, um, or if anybody takes this pill, they'll probably be better at critical thinking or logic. So what happened is we have a sample size in the first example that's really small or weak, and then we have the second example where it's really strong, meaning we're testing a lot more students. But the bottom line with this is whatever sample size you have, whether it's small, medium, or large, you're using it to make an application to a generate um, uh, the general population as a whole. Whenever you're doing that, you're dealing with the generalization. Drug commercials are notorious for doing this, okay? Um, so whether you're dealing with diet, uh, whether you're dealing with um, things that can help you with your health, there's always statistical data that's been tested, or um, that's statistical data was generated by testing groups of people. And then if those tests are really, really good and really accurate and they've tested a lot of people, well, they think they can help anywhere in the world, therefore they put a commercial out there, a drug commercial, okay? And you might say, the, the bigger picture here is it seems like, well, we know it's inductive, right? Because it's based upon generalization. And remember earlier, I was telling you inductive is like the scientific method. So yeah, it turns out when you test drugs and you make commercials and you, and you tell people, hey, if you got heart, chest pain, and you take this drug, maybe it helps you with cholesterol. Yeah, maybe it really does work because it's had a lot of scientific testing. Um, over a long period of time, a large number of people. So it turns out it really works well, but it's not a 100% certainty. Think of it this way. There might be four or five drugs that help with your cholesterol or weight or your intellectual capacity. Which one do you take? I don't know. Do you? See how that works? It's never 100% certain. You have to go with your best um, critical thinking apply to this and say, okay, well, which drugs have the less side effects, which drugs help a quicker um, amount of time, this and that. Again, it's never 100% certain like the deductive, but it comes close. So do your best, pick the best drug that you think might work for you. And, you know, if you have a health problem or you want things to work out for you better. That just me teasing out an example of an inductive argument, generalization, and how we see it all the time in drug commercials, okay? Argument for authority. Um, so 
basically someone is an expert in some area and then they make this proclamation about some other thing. They're arguing from their authority. So you can read Hurley's example in this. I'm just going to give you an argument from authority um, using me. I am your professor. I am teaching you either critical thinking or logic, depending on what class you're in, right? You might say, I hope this guy's an expert. Well, it turns out I am. I've, I've done this for more than five years. Um, also, I'm getting a PhD in philosophy. Um, I've had advanced logic classes at graduate level. So at my master's degree, I had symbolic logic. Um, in my PhD program, I had advanced logic. I mean, who in their right mind does that? Well, I did, so I'm teaching it to you, right? But now let me let me switch gears. So now let's say I were to teach you critical thinking and logic, and you were to look into my authority, and you were to say, well, let me look at this guy's credentials. What if I said I only have a PhD or I'm getting a PhD in botany? I'd say, what? This guy's got a PhD or he's getting a PhD in botany? So he's like an expert with plants and all that kind of stuff? What in the world is he doing teaching us logic? Exactly. So when you come on to an argument from authority, you want to make sure that the person stating that they have authority or expertise in an area is applicable to the area they're trying to teach you about. If not, they don't have the authority to be teaching you. Okay, let's just, we'll see more about that later, but when we get to chapter three, we'll see how there could be a fallacy there. But whenever you're trying to identify what kind of a form an argument has, if somebody's making a claim based upon expertise or authority, that is deductive or inductive? Well, we're in the inductive section. And we know it's inductive based upon presumed authority or witness. Okay. Argument based upon signs, you can read about this. Um, causal inference, an argument that proceeds from a knowledge of a cause to a claim about an effect. And those are just examples. You can you can look at the particular and the general, and this was what I was telling you about that I don't spend a lot of time on. You might say that this is an old school distinction, <clears throat> but I'll give you an example. Three is a prime number, five is a prime number, seven is a prime number. These, these seem to be very particular statements about reality, right? And then the conclusion says all odd numbers between two and eight are prime numbers. It seems more general, and it tells you. Here's one that proceeds from the particular to the particular. Oh, sorry, up above this guy that we just read. Here's a deductive argument that proceeds from the particular to the general. You know, if it proceeds from the um, particular to the general, it's inductive. But then Hurley gives you an example from the particular to the general that's deductive. He gives you an exception. You can also see this with these other two. So it, it's, it basically says, yeah, inductive arguments usually go from the particular to the general. However, we can show you one that goes from the general to the particular, and vice versa over here. And to me, when you're learning about critical thinking or logic, it's not necessarily important to understand these two. What's really important is this. <clears throat> when you're dealing with inductive and the premises are true, does your conclusion follow 100% or probabilistically? Like it, get, it gets close to the um, conclusion following, but not 100% certain. That's inductive if it's probable or in degree. Deductive, it follows necessarily 100%. It's all or nothing. That's what I want you to know as a hallmark between these two, inductive and deductive, more than I want you to know this, okay? So don't get hung up on that. All right, <clears throat> so now summary. You can read the summary here. And by the way, for some of you that didn't know this, in your books, so I'm in chapter two, what you do is right above chapter two, you have a summary from chapter one. And you'll have this for each chapter, right? It gives you a summary for the entire chapter. These are really, really helpful. So before you even read section 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, maybe you read the summary. You know, some of the deductive arguments, inductive arguments, they're right there. You can get quick summarized bullet points. Um, <clears throat> but enough of that. So let's go to a few homework examples. So 
And I know this video is rather long, but again, you can break this up into chunks and just um, listen to me when you can. Let's go back to 1.3. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read you a couple examples and you tell me what form you think it has, okay? 1.3. So you might have a similar homework for mind tap. Determine whether the following arguments are best to interpret as inductive or deductive. Then when you do, maybe tell me what form. Okay, so because a triangle A is congruent with triangle B, triangle A is isosceles, it follows that triangle B is isosceles. When you look at this, you might pull out your cheat sheet. You might say, hey, what's going on here? Well, does it seem like we're dealing with like geometrical or mathematical claims saying that um, conclusion follows it seems like we're doing that over here right geometrical proofs so what would this be inductive or deductive ding dong it's deductive right so let's look at our example deductive argument based upon mathematics okay let's look at the four no email messages are eloquent creations some love some love letters are eloquent creations Therefore, some love letters do not email messages. This one's deductive. Um, and I know I went quick on this, but if you looked at your cheat sheets, there's something in here. No. Watch this. Sorry. No, some, some, are. So all, none, some, and are, are. All, none, some. So if you have some of that language going on, you're looking at a categorical syllogism. Just makes an argument about categories of reality. And we'll, we'll learn about this a little bit more in 1.4. But again, the language, all and some. So without knowing whether the argument's good or not, we just want to know what kind is it? What kind is this thing? It's deductive. Seven. Paying off terrorists in exchange for hostages is not a wise policy, since such actions will only lead to them taking more hostages in the future. Now, which one is the premise? You got one sentence here. You don't got much room. And it's divided by a comma. That word sense is a premise indicating word. Go back to your earlier section 1.1 or 1.2. You can look at the trigger words. You know that's a premise, right? And it gives away something. There is a trigger word in here that gives away a certain form. Future. It's making a claim about the future based upon the present. And that is inductive. Okay, so those are just examples, and you got many more here, and you'll have similar ones on your homework. Um, but basically, we want to know, is it inductive or deductive? You can listen to this video. You can look at the cheat sheet that I gave you, or you can read more on Hurley's examples. But that is pretty much it for your homework. So I hope that has helped you with what's expected of you on 1.3. Okay, um, thanks for hanging in there, and I will see you next time.